now it's question and answer. that you all are doing is so impressive and very inspiring. But one um, interest that I have is in how to scale up some of these programs. And in the work that I do in colleges and universities, I find um, that it's very difficult to scale up what is um, a very expensive program. So have you had any discussions, I know you now have the center and, and you're working across the country, but you're serving a little bit less than 2,000 students. Have there been any conversations about how you could take this and scale it up to reach 20,000 students or 100,000 students. So when we started this program about uh, four years ago, we were in nine schools, I believe. That's what BNSF funding allowed us to do. And we were probably reaching about 600 students. So from nine schools, today we are in 22 schools, uh, and we hope that this coming year we'll be in 30 schools. So that's already a significant scale up uh, compared to where we started. Uh, at the same time, uh, my colleague Ben and I are working uh, to take this to a new level through a funding program from uh, a foundation working uh, hand in hand with uh, the first organization where we hope to create a robotic academy at the NYU Poly, uh, staffed with uh, graduate student mentors, but also clinics on the weekends and uh, mobile squads. Uh, that could get to the schools. Uh, and ultimately, uh, so currently the program model that we have, we provide graduate students uh, full support uh, to be in our program. Uh, they conduct research and uh, do 10 hour a week uh, uh, outreach. Going forward, I think what we might be doing is uh, recruiting graduate students who are already funded by their research programs and providing them some top of support on top of what they already get to provide maybe about five hours a week uh, for 10 weeks a semester outreach and uh, education in the K through 12 uh, schools. But it does not matter what university you go to, the universities are going to have only a limited number of graduate fellows. So the way I look at the scale up and replication is taking this model and implementing it in additional universities and colleges in New York City, uh, New York State, and then going beyond. Uh, if something works, it does not make sense to keep it just in your own institution. You should try to help propagate that model at other places. And I don't believe that this model is unique in its robotics focus only. It can actually apply to other disciplines as well. The key here is really a scientist who has passion for his or her field, is knowledgeable, and putting that individual alongside teacher in the classroom. There is nothing that stops you from scaling that up or replicating it in all the 50 states of the country. Ben? Uh, I would just add a couple things. Um, one is I think we need to be, uh, as a community who is interested in STEM education, we need to be candid with policymakers and funders and others, it's not cheap, right? Real science requires real stuff, and real scientists are professionals and deserve, of course, to be compensated for their work as do teachers and others, so I don't think we should, I agree, it's pricey, for sure, but we shouldn't back away from quality, right? Because that's what proper funding provides, is really it provides you enough money for um, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is just on this ad adaptation idea, there are lots of ways to do this. And so we've structured a number of different programs that are based on this model in one way or another. Um, and the responsiveness of the funding community is very high. Um, and I think that's, that's a positive sign of this recognition that real science requires real stuff and we need to invest in it if we're serious. Um, the last thing that I would say is, you know, teachers are really critical here, and you, you may not have a scientist in every classroom or a STEM professional in every classroom or a, a graduate student or a faculty member in every classroom, but we can expect and should expect a high-quality STEM teacher in every classroom. 
And so it's not necessarily a substitute, right, for having Ursula around. Um, but that's really, we got to think in that way, right? We have to think in a couple of different dom domains, in my view. We have to think about teachers really hard in the 100 can 10 if you're not involved. I encourage you strongly to look at it. I think it's a serious effort with very serious people involved. Um, and there are another, another effort called Partnering for Excellence, which is also trying to get STEM professionals more involved in classrooms. So it needs to happen in a number of levels, but my main point is let's not shy away from, I don't want to trade funding for quality. I, I don't want to dumb anything down. I, you know, funders come to us and say, well, can you do that? You know, it's like the corporate funder thing, right? Well, you know, we only have the $8,000, but, you know, we really need to get our brand out there and pretend that we care about STEM education. Not interested, you know. I, you know, we have to be strong as a community to maintain standards. For the uh, NYU team, how do you all pick the schools that you work with, and in particular, how do you choose the classrooms, the age levels? Can you just walk us through that process a little bit? Just Since I, I've been in a part of the program from the very beginning, and actually Ben was uh, at one time on the other side of the table as one of our funders. Uh, so this is a long story, but uh, to keep it short, uh, there's an individual by the name Lester Young who is uh, on the Board of Regents of New York State uh, living in Brooklyn who saw that the students in central Brooklyn were not getting given the basic math and sciences uh, leave alone any enrichment. So Lester Young, uh, with several of the potential funding organizations, came to us when he knew that we had a old GK12 fellows program and we had just started working in robotics. If we could help these schools uh, develop some serious uh, science and math uh, curriculum. Uh, so we initially started with uh, a pool of eight or nine schools. Uh, under a pilot grant from Brooklyn Community Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. And very quickly we turned it around into a large NSF grant. Uh, but at that point, the recruitment of schools was going to be based on the fact that we wanted to provide students in our program multiple opportunities to be in this program along their education. So that meant if we had a middle school in our original cohort, we wanted to find from that middle school what elementary schools do they draw the students in sixth grade. And then where do the students go after eighth grade into high schools? And then tapping into the elementary school uh, pipeline coming to this middle school and the high schools where they are feeding into. Uh, collecting all the applications, making sure that uh, principals were on board, there was at least some commitment from the teachers, and then doing face-to-face -face interviews to do the recruitment. But all along our uh, idea has been that you don't want to, first of all, we don't believe in going into the classroom for one day in the year, do some whiz bang, and get out. Because that's going to excite some people, but then leave them really disappointed when they don't have preparation and year-long engagement. But also, I don't think it's useful to engage a kid one time in their 12 years of schooling with uh, high-tech engineering or STEM principles and then leave them on their own. So we have really tried to be uh, engaging these kids multiple points along their career. So that's how we have been <coughs> selecting our schools. Uh, and usually our existing uh, school partners help us do this. I would just add that the, I think the, the critical the critical element, number one, if you're thinking about this or doing it with the school, prints the commitment of the administration, and you need to test that commitment again and again. You need a teacher like Lindrick who really wants to not only do best for his students or her students, but who also wants to develop their own professional skills and really see the value of working with a STEM professional or working with the university. Um, the third thing that I would say is, it was alluded to in one of the slides, is that, that, that right now, we, right now in New York City, 
there are way more schools who want to do this kind of stuff than we could possibly serve, right? There are 1,800 schools in New York City. We are in 22 of them. There are other programs like Yale and others that are doing great stuff. But right now, demand far exceeds supply. But that's because principals and administrators are taking the initiative. There are no engineering standards. There are no technology standards. No one is getting graded. No principal is going to lose their job based on how their kids do in engineering. Yet, when, that, when, that, when that happens, when that happens, you are going to see a flood of schools and administrators and principals, I won't say panic, but it's going to be close to panic because there are going to be new standards, they are going to be accountable for those standards, and they don't have these kinds of tools to do it. So again, like STEM is having its moment, but there are real challenges ahead. We can, you know, we can fuck around with the schools we want to be in, but when every school in the United States wants to be in, we kind of really have to think about, you know, how do you, how do you fund it and, and scale it up. Yeah, so be on the lookout for the next generation science standards, which are probably going to be released by the end of this month. And for the first time, engineering is going to be an integral part of K through 12 science education. I have a question that uh, that I think about a lot, uh, part of it's personal, my stage of my career and things. How are you advising the students on kind of the practicalities of a science career and I guess some of the sobering realities about the percentage of or what, what the job opportunities are realistically? Uh, so, uh, I'm a postdoc right now and one of the problems with postdocs is 15% of us were kind of ostensibly trained toward academic careers, but only 15% are going to have an academic career. And so students need to know what the broader potential is or or may not be as far as pursuing a career in science and engineering. That's a great question. Uh, actually, we are just starting out into uh, uh, some new programs, uh, both in K-12 STEM education uh, but our university as a whole has uh, I square E as its mission. So I personally believe that uh, a number of times you can probably get a small percent of students excited, interested, even become aware of uh, the possibilities and potential of science. But in order to get a large number of students interested in science and engineering, you have to really show them the career path. And I personally think that the career path that we need to show them is not that there is going to be a paycheck at the end of the month from a big multinational corporation or from a university, but rather you are going to create 100 paychecks for others. So we are about to start uh, a research experience for teachers program where teachers are going to come in and learn not only about engineering, but also about entrepreneurship and they're going to bring those concepts back in the K-12 classroom. And the kids will be participating in business idea competitions with the college students. And then the same high school kids will also have opportunities to do summer internships at startup companies. This is what we are doing at the K-12 level, whereas the university itself, is its motto is I square E, innovation, invention, and entrepreneurship. And if you guys saw the New York Times maybe today, you might have seen that NYU Poly just won the consolation prize from New York City for an applied science uh, institute in uh, urban sciences. Uh, so all of this is driven uh, to get people to understand that we are not going to be dependent just on somebody else providing us jobs but rather that we can create jobs for ourselves and for others if we have the right background. And it's not just science, it's not just engineering, but also being entrepreneurial and business-minded. To your, to your question, I would just say, um, I think sometimes that the crisis, the, the quote-unquote STEM crisis, is, is pitched that kids don't know the names of science careers or that science isn't cool. As a former uh, middle school teacher in Washington Heights uh, in, in New York City, I would say 
if I went around the room and asked students what they wanted to be, they would all shout, I want to work with computers, I want to be an engineer. I, all, they would name these careers. But that the problem was exactly what the NYU program is talking about, a lack of foundational skills and a lack of real access to what are the pathways that lead you to these careers and what are the challenges. So um, you deal with very practical things. Of, you need to take biology in high school if you want that if you want that trajectory. And I don't say that to, to be to be glib or to, to, to make a joke because it, it, it's it's a real challenge in schools. And so I think what one of the things that EL is doing about your question is if we want kids to become scientists, then they need to interact with scientists and and not just in in a one and we're all in agreement, not just in a meet a scientist one time sort of experience, but in a real dialogue, in a real partnership, in a real going to the lab, where these conversations and some of the challenges that you're alluding to can start to be discussed. So my stomach is telling me that. Um, that was the last question because we have time to discuss all of this in the open space portion. So I'm going to hold off all the other interactions because I can tell there's a lot more for this. And that's why we have these um, conversations at the front end. So uh, I'd like to thank the panel very much. <laughs> and give you a few instructions. So we're going to take a, um, a very brief break. 15 minutes. There's coffee if you go outside around past the grand piano towards the ballroom. And um, there's restrooms off to the right past there as well. So please be, be intentional about going and getting some coffee and some food. And I want to thank Art De Lorenzo and MIT because they're the sponsors for the coffee and the food that you have both today and tomorrow. He's arriving later by train. So he'll be here later today so you can thank him in person. And um, I want to thank, thank this first panel. It was just an awesome start. And we will be coming back at, hold on a second. So we'll be coming back at 1024. And we'll start with Derek, who actually made it on his way to the White House here. So I'm very glad to see you walk in the door there, Derek. So go have some coffee, get some refreshments, and we'll see you in 20 minutes. <laughs>